Welcome back to How to Tickle Yourself. I'm your host, Duff McDonald, along with my co-host, Matt McButter. Listeners of this podcast or readers of Tickled or any other writing I've done recently should be well aware at this point of my love of kombucha. After discovering it in 2017 or so, I soon found myself buying more at retail than I could reasonably afford, at which point I took Joey's advice and embraced the first legitimate hobby of my adult life and began to make kombucha. It would not be an exaggeration to say that it changed everything. So it should come as no surprise that I was excited to make the acquaintance of this week's guest, Hannah Crum, the kombucha mama. She and her partner, Alex Ligori, are longtime kombucha educators, advocates, and commercial consultants. They co-authored The Big Book of Kombucha, which is pretty much uh, an awesome encyclopedia of kombucha. In 2004, they founded Kombucha Camp, which I will let her tell you about. In 2014, they founded Kombucha Brewers International, a trade group, which I will also let her tell you about. In other words, she is the source of sources on this topic. Hannah and I agree that kombucha is a gift from God. It isn't just a drink. It's the universe in a bottle. It is harmony. It is health. It is freedom. It is choice. A bottle of kombucha contains lessons for all mankind. But let's let the kombucha mama speak for herself. Welcome to the show, Hannah. We are so happy to have you. Thanks for having me, Doc. Excited to be here. What an amazing intro. At the present moment, my love, my dear, or oh, everything's connected. This life, this world, it's all right now, right here. Right now, right here. Right now, right here. As you know already, I am obsessed, and I finally met someone who's more obsessed, so I'm very excited. <laughs> uh, for listeners who aren't in the know, uh, why don't we just start with the very basics? Tell them what kombucha is, and then maybe t- lead into how you got sucked into the kombucha vortex yourself. Yes, kombucha is fermented tea. It's an acetic acid ferment like vinegar, which gives it its signature sweet sour punch. So just like grapes make wine and uh, hops makes beer, uh, this is, it's tea that makes kombucha. And so you're starting with something that's incredibly healthy to begin with, and then you're fermenting it, making all of that nutrients even more bioavailable, and then also the power of vinegar. And so you're taking two superfoods, combining them together, and of course that is exponentially even better for you. Plus it's super fun to make at home, as you already know, and it comes in a zillion flavors, um, and I, I call it kombucha kids met. I believe it was an act of faith that brought me and kombucha together because a lot of people see kombucha based on her healing properties or digestive benefits. I had no issues that I was aware of at that moment, but, uh, I went to visit a friend from college in San Francisco where all the groovy things are back in 2003. <laughs> and he had like a filter on his shower, which was amazing because I was filtering my drinking water, but I was like, yes, get the chlorine off my skin. That's brilliant. He was drinking this stuff called Sole, which is pink Himalayan salt crystal water. I'm like, why are you drinking salt water? Isn't salt so bad for you? And of course, now I'm a Celtic sea salt, pink salt fanatic and drink salt water myself on most days. (laughs) And then he showed me these mysterious jars and he goes, that's the kombucha. We didn't try it. We just saw it floating there in its weird little matrix and went out for a raw food dinner um, that day, which was also a new experience for me at that time. But my curiosity was piqued. Kombucha is an interesting word. It's one that sticks with you. And so when I went back to LA at Whole Foods, lo and behold, shelf after shelf of kombucha, I grabbed a ginger aid. I cracked it open right there in the store. And what was your first sip like? What was my, you know what? Mine was ginger aid too. 
And interestingly enough, it was a guy from California. I was uh, spending a summer in Rockaway. The guy from California was living in the house I was in. And he came back from Whole Foods with Gingerade. And I, of co- I was like, I had no idea what it was. And as a recovering alcoholic, had constantly been in search of the interesting drink that wasn't seltzer or whatever. And when I uh, took a sip of ginger ale, it totally blew my mind. I was sold instantly on, it sort of met all the criteria, right? Fizzy, tasty, um, uh, the variety of flavors, of course, like you said, just jumped out at me, right? It's nearly infinite. And um, it was an entertaining drink. I did like you. I was not interested in the health benefits necessarily. You know, I I didn't have a problem with them, but I didn't seek it out for that reason. I actually was drawn to it by the variety. And from that first sip, never look back. I'll tell you about my first sip. I I I'm I am not as obsessed with with kombucha as the two of you clearly, but but I'm you know, but I I think it's I think it's a neat drink. Um, you poor bastard! You poor I, poor bastard! I I did go through. I would say a bit of a you know, I had a little um, tryst with kombucha as a drink a few years ago. Um, I can't remember when it was. Maybe in the like twenty twenty late twenty teens, and I'd never. It wasn't really on my radar. As, and then all of a sudden, you know, somebody mentioned it could have been tough. Actually, I, I don't know. Somebody I'd sort of it had bubbled into my consciousness a little bit. And I was like, OK, I'm going to I'm going to give this stuff a try. And I think the first one I had was it's like a cayenne carrot. I can't remember the name of the um, the name of the brand, but I, I like spicy drinks and spicy stuff. I, the ginger aid sounds great, actually. I love ginger beer and ginger beer based cocktails would be the main cocktail that I would ever have. So. So I gave it a I gave it a try and I was like, oh, this kind of tastes awful but delicious at the same time. <laughs> you know, like it's sort of a little bit like, you know, my maybe my first sip of alcohol as a teenager. Exactly. Or coffee. <laughs> yeah, or coffee. Right? Where it was like, this is not really good, but I kind of can see if I drank a lot of it, how I would start to like it more. Like all the finer things in life, it's an acquired taste. Nail on the head there. Totally. Well, and I love you mentioned ginger beer. So just quickly, fun fact, it was the most popular beverage in the United States before prohibition. So humans and ginger, we just have a love affair with that, with that rhizome. And it really was, you know, and of course, ginger ale came after prohibition, the the soda version, but ginger beer was the thing that people really loved. So my first sip, oh, the heavens opened up, the angels were singing, I was sad, standard American diet, eating a bunch of, you know, pardon my French, crappy processed foods. And, you know, while it wasn't taking its awful toll there in my late 20s, I also wasn't consuming any fermented foods. So the enzymes, the nutrients, they literally electrified my body. Now, true confession, I was the girl sneaking the pickle juice out of the pickle jar. Mom was like, don't drink that. It's so bad for you. And the salt and the sour, I just, I loved it. And so it really sang to this pickle juice lover and um, liked up. My thirst outgrew my budget. I had seen the magical jars. I went to the Beverly Hills Public Library, checked out every book they had on kombucha. I asked on one of the free lists, got a SCOBY here in LA and started making them my own. So yeah, the SCOBY is an acronym, which stands for Symbiotic Culture of Bacteria and Yeast. It was a term coined in the 90s to distinguish the culture itself from the actual beverage. Otherwise, they were just calling it kombucha, kombucha, kombucha. That got too confusing. So it is a bacterial cellulose. They excrete this um, cellulosic structure from their cell walls and become a scaffolding or a raft, if you will, that then literally other organisms depend I mean that both in that literal sense where they're hanging off of them, the yeast that we see, which actually kind of looks like a brown seaweed known as kombu. Is this where we got the word kombucha? Because it sort of Mm. looked like uh, something else, uh, as well as other diverse organisms. And so it is this mothership that we literally pass from batch to batch that inoculates the sweet tea and turns it into the kombucha. And so you probably have everything you need at home to make kombucha right now, except maybe a SCOBY. And that's where having a friend like Duff could be helpful to grab your SCOBY. Or if you don't have any friends making kombucha, Kombucha Camp, where bacteria farmers 
we've got loads of SCOBYs looking for homes. So, um, so we're always happy to oblige if anyone needs a culture. So, so you just mentioned kombucha camp. What is that? Kombucha camp. So I took uh, an artist way workshop in 2003. And at the end of that, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, kind of an old school book, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, walks you through morning pages and, and all these things. And what I found in my core and the heart of my being was I wanted to teach people how to make kombucha. I, my life had felt transformed by it. I was in love with it. And I really wanted to share that love with other people. So kombucha camp with a cake, some cute and clever. Um, was started in 2004 in my tiny little LA guest house. And in 2007, turned into a blog where I was just talking about kombucha. I was frustrated by the inaccurate information. There's a lot of fear stories uh, that go around about it. But in reality, kombucha has never harmed anybody. Um, it's incredibly safe to make and brew at home. And you know, if you drink too much, you're just going to end up in the bathroom. So it's self-moderating in that regard. And then um, people started asking, hey, do you have a SCOBY? Do you have a this? So that gradually led my husband and I to decide to collaborate. He has a film background and made a series of videos. And then um, he poured his heart, soul, and energy into building our business. So kombuchacamp.com as an e-commerce site was launched in 2010. Amazing. So in the big book of kombucha, which is not, you know, it's both got recipes and stuff, but it's also like a history and it's a um, it's a wonderful book. There, you have a bunch of great things in there, and one of them was you described kombucha as a gateway food. Is it like reefer madness? Right, one one sip, and you're gonna be in orgies and political protests and stuff, murdering people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it is. It's a gateway into fermented foods. It's a gateway into gut health. It's a gateway into taking back your power. One of the many beautiful lessons that kombucha teaches us is when you give an organism what it needs to thrive, in this case, tea and sugar and the right temperature, it will. And that applies to us as well. And unfortunately, we are so toxified in this world, not just from actual chemicals poisoning our water, food, air, et cetera, but from propaganda, from information that is telling you, hey, have this poison pimped by pretty people in a pretty package and you'll be pretty too. And, you know, that has led to a massive crisis of health in this country and in many countries. And so what kombucha does is it gives you a way to take back your health, because when you start to drink kombucha on a regular basis, you slowly lose your cravings for sugar and for alcohol. And so it's, it's a beverage that can really support health, but it's also, you know, look, sauerkraut used to smell like dirty socks. And sometimes it still does. But because I've had kombucha in my life, it shifted my palate. It shifted my cravings. I now I love eating sauerkraut. I love beet kvass. Um, you know, learning about all the wonderful world of fermented foods and drinks is just one of the many things that kombucha can help us, along with all these sort of metaphoric things that I allude to. Hmm. I, I love sauerkraut. And I've come to love, like in the last maybe decade, I've come to love kimchi as well. So good. On that note, you refer to kombucha as the most versatile ferment in the world. What do you mean when you say that? (laughs) So you can flavor her with anything. As you saw in the book with our 200 and some odd flavoring inspirations, inspirations, because I'm not trying to dictate uh, how your kombucha should taste. Not only do we have recipes for all the fruits and herbs and flowers, we also include bacon. (laughs) We include uh, uh, savory recipes as well, because right. Kombucha, uh, sorry, vinegar is something we use in salad dressing. It's something we use for pickling. So we already associate that flavor profile with stuff that's more savory as well. And literally a little bit goes a long way. And so you can infuse any type of flavor you like in kombucha. Now here's the other thing. The SCOBY is flexible technology. That means we can take it and we can ferment almost any substrate. There are studies showing it fermenting milk instead of a kefir grain, or we can use different herbs and things like in the Hannah's blend. We also have yerba mate and rooibos in Brazil. Yerba mate is the most popular type of kombucha that they brew down there. And so as long as we, and I always say, you know, use a backup from your SCOBY hotel, just in case you don't want to kill your only mother. Um, but you can experiment. You can, you can do a broad range of ferments with the kombucha culture. Mm, Mate uses SCOBY. I didn't realize that. It can. Yeah. Yeah. 
They might micro adapt over time. And so that's where we even have Jun, which is kombucha's raw honey cousin. And while it looks almost identical to a kombucha culture, it is different in that it's able to harmonize with the bacteria present in raw honey. Whereas a traditional kombucha scoby, there's competition. It could die. It doesn't, it doesn't thrive or proliferate. We switched to, to honey, uh, a year or two ago, find it's more of a subtle, uh, flavor than the, than the cane sugar stuff. So uh, as you know, I have a chapter in Tickled called Infinite Kombucha. I've written a story for my college magazine on kombucha about my obsession with it. But if you'd asked me, I would have said that I had a unique experience with kombucha. And then I talk to you and I go read your book and you have this line where you say something magical often happens when kombucha comes into people's lives. That moment of kombucha kismet is often a bright dividing line between a life ruled by inertia and a path of conscious choice. And, you know, part of my revelation about kombucha was about infinite possibility and infinite choice. And so I'm reading it. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm not special at all. This is what happens to people when they get, you know, drawn into the world of kombucha. Why is that? I feel like why it is, right? There are probably physiological reasons in that, you know, our diets are out of whack. We're not getting, again, digestive enzymes and the nutrients. Kombucha has all of the B vitamins in living form. So including the ever elusive B12, again, not in massive doses, but in a form that your body can instantly uptake and utilize. And because we've been so nutrient deprived, of course, there's that physiological like, oh, I'm actually energized. I actually feel really good drinking this kombucha. And then I think there's also, this is a culture that has learned how to cooperate, which, you know, again, there's the theories of evolution and it's all about competition, but the reality is the vast majority of our ecosystem is in cooperation. And Mm -hmm. and that is what I think when you're consuming the byproduct of a culture that has already established healthy boundaries, because healthy boundaries makes a healthy culture, then you're able to bring that sort of peace within yourself. So that's a very metaphorical way of thinking about it. But I feel like, again, this this stuff, you can let it be as transformative and healing as you want it to be. Now, there's never going to be one magic bullet or one thing that's going to cure you of all your ails. But if again, it's that gateway, it's that way into uncovering, well, what if this is so good for me, what else could be good for me? And how else can I um, you know, also embrace diversity? Diversity is key to kombucha. And diversity is what we see in nature. When you walk out your door, it isn't one flower, one type of tree, one type of grass. It is a wide variety of things living together. Yes, competing. Yes, cooperating. And that's how we as human beings really need to um, rise to the occasion of the times we have around us right now. I really feel like kombucha is a rebel's drink. And it's a drink for these times because she's here first and foremost to detoxify, to reduce inflammation. And then secondarily, because she gives us an example of what we can do when we truly are, when our needs are taken care of, because we're healthy and we're in alignment, we're sane and our brains are functioning and our guts are functioning. So I, I just, I love her. (laughs) I have a question, another kind of practical one here. What, what is the difference between, I think, I think I once called it carbonated and Duff said it's not carbonated or or it's, it's effervescent. So what's the difference between an effervescent drink? And a carbonated drink. Carbonic acid. Okay. Right. And so this is why some people even have a problem with sodas and things is because the carbonic acid can have an an impact on your body. And in fact, when kombucha producers force carbonate, it changes the flavor profile of their product. It actually is an acid. And so you have to have a different flavor of kombucha going into that process in order to have the right balance. Effervescence is what's created by yeast. So the root for yeast is bevere, which means to boil. Because when ancient man looked into their fermentation pots, what did they see? Little bubbles, little bubbles on top that they typically would see when they boiled water. But Hmm. there was no boiling happening. However, fermentation does also create heat and energy. And I truly believe that human beings are hardwired to seek bubbles because they promise inherent nutritional value. And this is the bait and switch of soda. 
right? Soda wants mm. to be a fermented drink. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it puts fake acids that actually deplete nutrients from your body along with sugar to trick your tongue into thinking with that effervescence, oh, I'm having a fermented beverage. But in fact, what you're having is, you know, poison and pretty packages. So with kombucha, that they entire promise is, they do. <laughs> <laughs> and I line their pocketbooks and have for over a hundred years and look how huge they are. I mean, kombucha is a tiny fraction compared to all of the money generated by the beverage industry. We are this still tiny little drop at a billion dollars. Um, mm. When you consider how much these companies have profited off of making us sick. And so fermented foods and drinks that effervescence, it's natural, it's gentle. The bubbles come in different sizes. They pop at different rates. With carbonation, you can tell the difference because the, the bubbles are consistent in size and they all pop sort of at the same rate. You can even feel it on your tongue, that difference. And so mm. effervescence is soft. Effervescence is gentle effervescence is, you know, it's fun and it's exciting. And it's not to say if you leave your bottle in the wrong conditions, you won't end up with a bottle bomb. She can also be explosive um, if she builds up, if that pressure builds up. But you just, I mean, I wish you could have seen when I poured this kombucha, I had a head of foam this huge. It was so beautiful. When Joey and I went to Burning Man in 2019, I made the mistake of leaving some bottles that were in this, their second ferment out on the shelf. So it was August. We were gone for 10 days, came back. Uh, they had, I don't know if the, like the glass hadn't exploded. I think the top shot off with such force that it knocked these gallon bottles off the shelf in the kitchen. And there was kombucha everywhere under the fridge, on the ceiling, in the drawers. You've been initiated. So there's been more than one kombucha brewer who has geysered decorated their ceiling by not being really careful when opening their bottles. And in the summer here, our bottles get really fizzy, but we have a very specific way in which we open them. So I'm personally not a fan of the swing tops or the easy caps. I just feel like they're harder to control. I really prefer a screw top. And then we use like, you know, those little rubber thingies you use to open a jar. So we oh, have yeah. that over it. And because that creates this sort of, so if anything shoots out, it's coming down off of that back into the sink. I mean, people will put plastic bags over them. There, there's a variety of techniques to prevent geysering. Open, up, open them in your kombucha safe room. <laughs> but right? it's kind of an initiation. It's a you know yeah. baptism by kombucha. You mentioned uh, this the name of that seaweed um, in your book. You you talk about a bunch of different legends of the origins of kombucha. What's the real story? Give give us the real story. Well, we hearken our origins back to 221 BC, which is the uh, when the Qin Shi Huangdi united China. The Chinese are famous for their quest for longevity elixirs. They, of course, are the cultivators of tea. And so it makes a lot of sense that they would have uh, a tea fermented product. Now, in my research, what I found is like tea wasn't commonly consumed in homes until more like 800, the Tang Dynasty. So which is when the Chaluan came out, the sort of the big tea book. Um, and so it, it's not entirely clear, although some of the legends do check out. So it's purported that in 414 AD, a doctor from Korea, the kingdom of Silla, came to Japan to help an ailing emperor in Yoko. And his name is very long in Japanese, and I don't remember it off the top of my head, but you could somewhat construe it to be Dr. Kombu if you were to um pare it down a little bit. So some of the legends do check out. What we know is that research started was already in earnest at the early 1900s. A.A. Bashinskaya, female researcher in Russia, had been collecting samples from all over the country. If you look at northern China, of course, it's close to Russia. It's close to Korea. So it makes sense how all this whole area could be where kombucha came from. And it continued in popularity during World War I and World War II, when Germans started bringing it back to Germany from Russia. And from there, folks like Dr. Rudolf Spinar, who famously used it along in a concentrated form with some other um, elements to help cancer patients and things like this. It's, it's been around for a really long time. There's been quite a bit of research on it, just not here in the United States and not, you know, pharmaceutical type trials, which means they're always saying there's no research on kombucha. Forget it's been consumed for thousands of years by lots of people who say it does the same types of things to help improve their health. We couldn't possibly believe that that's true without putting people through a pharma lab. Like trial now could we um gosh forbid we actually use our critical experience thinking yeah experience <laughs> is proof of nothing exactly i have another quote i wanted to read uh and matt this goes back to your point about how it tasted great and horrible at the same time 
Hannah writes, it is a living contradiction, at once beautiful and ugly, hearty yet delicate, both mother and baby. It springs forth anew with each batch, a physical manifestation of a successful brew that also protects against contamination and prevents evaporation. I guess you're referring to the SCOBY there. Correct. Um, It is, uh, to Matt's point, when people see it, they are horrified and intrigued, right? Because it because it looks like it could be an alien, but also it's clearly the source of such great flavors and and stuff. So to me, when I read that, I suddenly it made me think. It's like, oh my god, okay, the Scoby transcends duality, right? It contains everything, not just opposites but the pairs of opposites right it's beautiful and ugly at once and anything that can rise above and transcend the opposites is obviously headed in the right direction um so why transitioning would uh uh an industry that makes such a wonderful magical drink need a lobbying arm yeah. Kombucha Brewers International, which you founded. Why is that even necessary? So let's pick up our story back in 2010. So 2010 was also the year that all of whole, all the Whole Foods forced the kombucha producers to buy back their kombucha. Very costly, very challenging, very damaging because there were bottles found on the shelf that contained above the 0.5% alcohol by volume um, which is the taxation threshold set during, again, prohibition 100 years ago when you weren't supposed to be drinking nothing. Um, it was originally set at 2%, but too many pharmacists were dispensing too much cough syrup that was violating the rules, aka still trying to get people the liquor they wanted. And so they tightened that restriction a half a percent. So again, this is an arbitrary number, not based on any sort of science. Kombucha can naturally contain up to one and a quarter, 2% alcohol by volume, just depending on how it's handled, when you're flavoring it, how much sugar is present in that flavor for the secondary fermentation. At the time, there weren't accurate testing methods available for the trace amounts of kombucha. When you think about a scientific method, if it's a plus or minus 1% margin of error, that's amazing. That's incredibly precise. But plus or minus 1% margin of error is compliance or non-compliance for kombucha. And at the heart of it, kombucha producers are good people. We want to do what's right. We want to follow the rules. We want to be compliant. And so in 2016, well, let me go back. So then we founded Kombucha Brewers International in 2014. So um, Alex and I did a couple of cross promotions on the internet, social media, just to raise the profile of kombucha that Um, On my blog, I had always interviewed kombucha producers. I had made a long list. I'm a collector. That's the collection thing that I was doing. And so I just, I loved anybody who was as excited about kombucha as I was. And I wanted to elevate them. I wanted to bring them together. I'm just, I'm a one in my numerology. I'm a leader. I can't help but bring people together. So, um, and kombucha is what impelled me to do so. So that crisis in our industry, you know, our trade group is founded out of crisis and we continue to evolve out of crisis. And finally, in 2014, we had our first ever kombucha con where we brought everybody together to start talking about these issues. We initiated a process with AOAC, which is an international standard setting organization to find more accurate testing methods for kombucha, which I'm happy to say we even have in-house testing methods available as well as lab validated testing. Um, And we've had our kombucha act ever since 2016 when Jared Polis was still in the Congress. He was our original a uh, champion there, Ron Wyden in the Senate has been our original co-sponsor. And right now, Blumenauer, who from Oregon, is also our co-sponsor. So we've had to reintroduce it with every every couple of years. And part of that is tax reform is incredibly challenging. It's not a big enough bill to stand alone. So it's always going to have to be paired with something else. I don't want to go into the rigmarole of lobbying. It is not fun. <laughs> Trying to get any sort of logical change here in the United States is incredibly difficult. I know they're dealing with massive problems, but it's just, it's very challenging to try to update arcane rules. Um, That said, our effort is, you know, we continue to educate. I've got meetings today. Um, In a way, the pandemic's been helpful because it means we've been able to go online with these meetings as opposed to having to show up in DC, which costs time, money, energy, et cetera. Uh, Now we get to just make phone calls and and Zoom calls to help uh, champion our cause. But we have really great supporters. We have bipartisan support. And again, this common sense update, which simply changes the taxation threshold from half a percent to one and a quarter percent, 
mirrors our cultural counterparts. Canada is 1.1. Australia is 1.1. Europe is 1.2. Mexico is 2%, right? So we're not even trying to go up to 2%. And let me just say one more thing about the alcohol, if you will, because you're probably thinking, wait, I struggle with alcoholism. Why am I drinking this beverage that has trace amounts of alcohol in it? Am I, am I somehow doing something wrong? And I mentioned earlier that kombucha actually helps curb our cravings for alcohol. Um, now, how they ended prohibition back in the 30s was a bunch of scientists sat around Harvard Meal drinking beer, and they decided that beer that had 3.2 by weight, which was 4% by volume, was considered not intoxicating. They then put it back to the states, and so you still have some states with these 3.2 laws on their books. But one and a quarter percent doesn't even approach half of what the, our own government already considers is not intoxicating. What it does is it allows for that raw, unpasteurized product to um, have a longer shelf life, such that once it's distributed out into the world, like a piece of fruit, like juice, raw juice, it can continue to change in the bottle. And that's what we wanted to do because we want the live product. Yes, we can have kombucha from concentrate. Yes, we can have pasteurized kombucha. But as the body knows, the product that's going to give you the most bang for your buck is that raw living product. And so this legislation simply allows for that product to go out into the world at half a percent in compliance when it leaves the facility. And should it go up to 0.6 or 0.8, you're not going to be subject to excise taxes and um, and the product will be safe for people to consume. All right. So good luck with that because <laughs> as a recovering alcoholic, like I don't, I'm with you. It's like, I don't, th it's not a, it's not an alcoholic drink. Right. And it's, um, and in fact, it has um, satisfied something in me that I think alcohol spoke to. Do you want to hear my theory on that? Sure. I think humans crave alcohol. We need it on a certain level. It's um, I call it a vital nutrient. Other people would argue with that statement. And here's why. Because the alcohol in kombucha acts as a carrier. So first and foremost, it's a preservative. It's there to kill things like dangerous microbes or pathogens. You think of rubbing alcohol in a wound, right? We know to apply alcohol to a wound because it's going to be antimicrobial. Secondarily, it's medicinal. It thins the blood. It allows you to absorb the nutrients easier. And when consume, and when you think about ancient man, we weren't making tequila. <laughs> we were making flowers fermented into these low alcohol beverages and consuming them on a regular basis for their medicinal properties. And so, uh, and maybe it's wrong to say alcohol is a vital nutrient. However, it's something that humans have consumed since the dawn of time, since we could make alcohol, we have been. And, and kombucha satisfies that craving without creating intoxication. And in fact, kombucha contains um, acids that bond with toxic molecules in your liver and detoxifies the liver. So it does literally the exact opposite of what alcohol mm. or high alcohol beverages does. Now I also posit that pasteurizing alcohol and distilling alcohol turns it into a controlled substance because now you've removed all of the yeast, the B vitamins, all of the other nutrients that might support a healthy consumption pattern and turn it into just a controlled substance. Ah, okay. Okay. So what's your favorite uh, flavor that you've made? From the book or elsewhere? My fave flav hands down is always going to be Love Potion 99. It's blueberry lavender rose. In the summer, I switch it up to elderflower lemon. I've been a St. Germain fan for a really long time, and it makes a fantastic cocktail mix. I'm going to, we're going to try um, a recipe I just read about or read yesterday avocado. Whoa. Excited to hear how that goes. <laughs> Matt? You want to try my avocado kombucha? I'll try anything once. So yeah, I'd give it a go for sure. What, are you going to just pop it into chunks? Are you going to puree it? How are you going to get the avocado in there? I'm going to, I'm going to follow the recipe. What does the recipe say? Oh, uh, let me grab the book. I can't remember. It was like, <laughs> I think you had it as like, uh, oh, here we go. Um, mashed avocado, uh, two tablespoons. Uh, but, oh no, here's the one I'm going to do. Peppercado. Uh, it's mashed avocado and black pepper. Yum. Right. So we're going to try that on our next batch to close out here. I just want to read a couple other things because there's insights in your book that sort of ma made me realize what had happened to me, um, that I think are really important. One of them that you say is a powerful pull is exerted when you create food that nourishes your community and people express their gratitude for that nutrition. Kombucha is the first thing I have ever given away in bulk, right? And over time in my life, like I've given 
gifts, but not, I didn't have a sort of a systematic thing that I made to give away. And you're exactly right. Like we had it at a friend's house on the weekend and we took over four bottles um, and their excitement over all the different flavors, but also over the health benefits. Um, I, re- I realized, and I just read the line in your book before we went over there. I was like, wow, this feels really good. And there's something um, so magical about being able to give people something that it helps their health. Right. So that's I've never really done that before. And then you had one other one uh, where you said in the brewing process, a kind of alchemy takes place, transforming these common elements, which is basically tea um, and sugar and flavoring into an extraordinary nutritive tonic, producing a sum greater than the parts. And to me, that wraps it all up. Right. So for like, Somehow, uh, something that I thought was just a drink, that I thought was just a hobby, that I thought was just a, uh, a, a thing that I was amusing myself with became something much, much, much bigger. And, uh, you know, we're at the point now where we have a kegerator in the house so we can have two five gallon kegs of kombucha on tap at all times. And I think you capture in your book, not, not only like a bunch of great recipes and stories and history and stuff, but you get at this deeper stuff that you, that you mentioned a lot here today, that this is not just another drink. Uh, it is something else entirely. And, uh, I couldn't be happier that it came into my life and I couldn't be happier that you came into my life. So thanks for uh, speaking with us today, Hannah. This was wonderful. Uh, And anybody who's even remotely interested, The Big Book of Kombucha, you can get it where you get all your books or where you buy everything, Amazon. Check out Kombucha Camp if you want to start making your own. And uh, I'll see you at KombuchaCon in 2022. What year is this? 2023. 2023. (laughs) We'll we'll see you there next year. Thank you, Hannah. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. So the kombucha mama, uh, she's great. And it's really, it's really wild. Like it's, uh, the big book of kombucha is a deep book. It is, it is not only a cookbook recipe book. There's stuff in there, uh, that she gets to the root of it all. Are you, Mm -hmm. are, are we, did we convert you any further? You gonna try it again? It's it's funny. I actually I took a note in my in my notebook as I often do while we're recording. It says, uh, "Matt, kombucha over coffee for one month, <laughs> like a little <laughs> experiment." <laughs> I was like, maybe I should because I go pretty heavy on the coffees, right? We have a Nespresso, and I I'm probably like on a light day, I probably drink four of those. You know, like I, I'm usually more like five, maybe like another one in the afternoon. It's a lot of coffee, and I know it's not great. I know it's probably not a good idea to consume that much coffee. So yeah, I think when I experimented and dabbled in, in kombucha, whenever that was like a several years ago, it was a little bit because I was drinking too much coffee and I was like, I'm going to try kombucha instead. And then you just, you know, habits, old habits die hard. I just kind of fell back into drinking coffees all the time, but this has inspired me to maybe, you know, booch it up a little, a little more. Oh, totally. And you know what? It's like, there's a magazine, there's Booch News and a magazine called Symbiosis Magazine. How many how many kombucha magazines do you subscribe to? <laughs> I don't subscribe. <laughs> I actually okay. found those t- at the same time I found Hannah. Um, <laughs> since you tried it, even if it was like yeah. four years ago, there's the amount, the availability of of flavors and stuff has probably quadrupled. There were already a lot of options back then. And now I've noticed it's, you know, now it's like you, you guys are talking about it being non-alcoholic and stuff, but I've seen it all over the, uh, the LCBO, the, which is the, where you buy alcohol in Ontario. Well, they do hard kombucha. Yeah. Hard kombucha. Right? So they can, it's like, that's like a hard iced tea. Yeah. I love Hannah. Like what a, what a, she's a great example too of like, she got sucked in just like I did in the exact mm-hmm. same way I did and then went for it. <laughs> Yeah. She she's basically the voice of kombucha. Yeah. And um 
uh the book is great it's um if you ever and oh the other thing is the gateway point she made my friend peter barrett who we had on here yes. last season said the same thing he says as soon as you um uh, get rid of the inertia that you have just thinking that kombucha is now your thing and and you realize that you're now a fermenter mm-hmm. uh he says your yeah. your whole world is gonna blow wide open yeah there there's it's like pickling too right like yeah it, no same another, thing pickles yeah. yeah so he he i was i was over there yesterday talking to him and he it was it, it was almost like he was uh he's telling me it's just sort of waiting for me to wake up to the mm-hmm. fact that i'm now a fermenter hilarious interesting note too that she said uh it was when she went deep into kombucha and it totally changed her life it was it coincided with reading the artist's way which Mm -hmm. was you know another guest we had on cam drynan said it was you know sort of the same thing and forcing that discipline of getting up every morning and kind of writing your notes and focusing on a creative pursuit really um Absolutely. You know, it, it is what sort of like drove her in that direction. So yeah. I, and that and that line that I read where she says that moment of kombucha kismet is often a bright dividing line between a life ruled by inertia and a path of conscious choice. You could not describe what happened to me more precisely than that. Suddenly yeah. I was existing at the realm of possibility. Right. And thinking, mm-hmm. oh, my God, what are we going to do this time? What are we going to do this time? What is what what else can we do? And it basically like kickstarted something creative in me that had mm-hmm. just been sitting inert. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've to settle something here. She said there are a zillion flavor possibilities, and you've often claimed that it's there are an infinite amount of flavor possibility. Which is it? This again, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, let's go with near infinite. Okay. Because, <laughs> because. What is infinite, right? All right, so I've got one for you. This one we, uh, Joey, uh, discovered the other day. So in uh, Sanskrit, there is the word sutra. You know, in in religious texts, in Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, they often have uh, books of sutras which are aphorisms, but like the Brahma Sutras and the Vedanta Sutras. And they're basically, you know, pithy, um, condensed religious and spiritual insights. Right. Yeah, I'm familiar with the Kama Sutra as I think many people would be. Yeah. Okay. So Sutra means a string or a thread. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. So in the Brahma Sutras and stuff, you're reading thread, the threads that are woven through the the spirituality of it all Mm -hmm. sutures that we use are sterile surgical threads used to you know sew yourself up after surgery so sutures we've concluded comes from sutra so concluded concluded or, yeah. or yeah. <laughs> next, <laughs> next okay. time you yeah. are getting stitched up, know that it's basically sewing up your a piece of your spirituality, keeping you intact. Cool. I love it. So today's Oriobindo is gonna touch on what Hannah was talking about. So one of her main points about kombucha is that it's the symbiosis in it the cooperative nature of the of the bacteria and the yeast um it helps bring your own body back into balance in uh hindu philosophy they talk about uh the three gunas uh tamas which is inertia rajas which is um activity and sattva which is balance and all of us, everything in the universe is some kind of mix of uh, those three things, right? Inertia, activity, and balance. And what you want ultimately is to raise your sattvic profile, the, the balance part of you, um, which is sort of of a, of a higher order than Thomas or Rajas, right? Inertia and activity. And here's what Oryabindo promises you will get 
once. Uh, he calls it the gifts of Satwa. And I'm going to just say it's the gifts of Kombucha too. The gifts of Satwa are the mind of reason and balance, clarity of the disinterested, truth-seeking, open intelligence, a will subordinated to the reason or guided by the ethical spirit, self-control, equality, calm, love, sympathy, refinement, measure, fineness of the aesthetic and emotional mind, in the sensational being, delicacy, just acceptivity, moderation, and poise, a vitality subdued and governed by the mastering intelligence. Right? Don't you want all those things? All you got to do is switch your coffee out for kombucha. You're halfway there. <laughs> I want those things just for a month. And then I might go back to coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. We'll be back with you next week. At the present moment, traveling town to town, the mystery of the motion, right here, right now. Right here, right now. Whoa, right here, right now. You've been listening to How to Tickle Yourself with your hosts, Duff McDonald and Matt McButter. You can help us by liking, subscribing, and sharing this podcast with others. You can talk to us and see what else is happening on Instagram and Facebook at How to Tickle Yourself. This program was recorded in Studio B of the historic Rock Ledge Recording Studio and the Tunnel Under Arundel. Right here, right now, our original 16-part theme music was written and recorded by the legendary Paul Reddick and Kyle Ferguson of the Sidemen with the brilliant Steve Mariner on bass and drums and in the mixing room. The podcast is produced and distributed by Storic Media. Our editor is Andrew Steiner. Our coordinator is Samantha Abramovitz. Our producers are Kristen Verbitsky and Chuck LaBella. For more information, visit storicmedia.com. That's S-T-O-R-I-C media.com. My love, my dear.